acquire skills and all of that uh, in the in the process. So the the sort of um, things I I get very excited about for the most part in the public policy space has been policies that can help lift up people, people from poverty, people from vulnerability, and so on. I thought that today, uh, coming to talk to you, I should maybe not focus too much on what government has done or what I have done per se. I think I gave a lecture on February the 7th to the country uh, where I stated a lot uh, about the various things that we had done in the area of infrastructure, digitalization, and so on. I think um, when the discussions come and I have to touch on some of those things, I will. But I, will, I think I want to focus more on the way forward what I would like to do, God willing, if I'm given the mandate to be president of this country. What can we expect from a Baumia government? Uh, and I think that that would really inform our discussion. For the most part and for the full, I'll be discussing some of the policies I have in mind. But I think that at the end of the day, my outlook is framed around a number of questions that you, you will be interested in. How do we reduce the cost of living for workers? How do we improve conditions of service of workers? How do we ensure that pensions are adequate for workers? How do we ensure that workers can get access to credit um, and so on. So these are, are some of the questions which, you know, what I will be addressing at the global macro level will have implications for some of these issues that I'm, I'm raising. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, if we have issues uh, that are not resolved at the macro level, they have micro implications. So when I talk about the government and how we reduce the cost of living and create space as far as the fiscal is concerned, it's very, very key. One of the things that we have done over the years uh, is that the size of government has grown. Uh, some people say it has grown too large, but it has grown. And government seems to want to do so much in the economic space, build all the roads, build all the hospitals, and everything. In so doing, there's a bed that comes from government. And government is therefore, in, in the process, looking to either increase taxes or increase borrowing to do that. One of the key things I want to bring about is essentially to realign government expenditure and bring a part of it towards the private sector. Why do I say this? I think that we can provide a lot of the services without necessarily um, focusing by on increasing and increasing government expenditure. The more government expenditure we increase, ultimately we have to tax more or borrow more. And when we have to do that, we create less space to increase the conditions of service of workers. If you have to spend a lot of your resources on paying interest, on loans and so on, you end up with less that is available for the people who are doing the work, who are essentially the membership that you talk about, uh, over 90% of public servants in the forum. So I have had an experience which I believe can 
we can take a cross. You know, when you look at the whole digitalization experiment, uh, 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 the policy of digitalization that we have started here, one of the interesting things about the digitalization policy is that most of it, if not all of it, has been led by the private sector. Most people don't realize it. The Ghana car, digital address, and so on, Ghana.gov, the digitalization of the ports, and so on, passport of it. So all of it is a private sector led program, which has meant that we have been able to do something to serve the public without government putting upfront money to do these things. Because if the government was to fund all of these, we couldn't have even gone as far as we have gone in the first place. We wouldn't have done it. But with the private sector putting up front the money and getting paid in bits over a long period of time, it means that the government didn't have to cough up that money in the first place. And so I think that that model is also very instructive in our general economic management. Because if you take it to the universities, for example, you see, for example, that you go to Tech or you go to Legon, the hostels are not built by government. They are built by the private sector. And the students are erecting them. Right? So you see that they are managed and built by the private sector. And we, are, we have that service. And you, you will see Therefore, that there is no delay in the completion of hostels which are being built by the private sector. They, they build them very quickly because they know they are going to get some revenue coming out of that. And we can apply that philosophy across the whole country, whether you are talking of roads, whether you are talking of classrooms, you are talking of hospitals, uh, you are talking of school buses. Government doesn't have to currently if you're going to buy buses for 700 secondary schools, you have to accumulate all the money for the 700 buses and go and pay for them before you can distribute them. It then takes you a long time. So there are many schools which want buses and don't have buses because government doesn't yet have all the money to go and pay for the buses. So you can say that, well, the private sector give us a lease of 700 buses. They will upfront fund the 700 buses to the schools. Every school will have a bus, and we will pay them monthly or quarterly for the, bus, for the use of the buses. And therefore, we don't have to look for that big money to do so. And therefore, the, the fiscal burden of providing these buses or so on will be much less. It's the same thing that we do with many, many pieces of infrastructure in the schools, for example. We could let the private sector do them, and we pay the private sector over time. And so this is, and when we do that, this fiscal space opens up, and therefore we are able to improve the conditions of service of workers in a better way. But if your space is tight, uh, you, you are not able to do so. So one of the things that I want us to do uh, in terms of the fiscal space is to really move the burden, shift some of the burden of expenditure to the private sector. Uh, and we can provide those services government wants to provide without really putting up a huge expenditure up front. And I'm looking at, therefore, shifting about 3% of GDP of expenditure from government to the private sector. And that will really open up a lot of space for government in, the, in terms of the fiscal space. I also want to make sure that in terms of control of government expenditure, uh, we have an independent fiscal responsibility council uh, to make sure that government uh, expenditure does not exceed 105% of the previous year's tax revenue so that we maintain a lot of discipline in that sector. So fiscal discipline along with opening up a lot of expenditure, realigning that expenditure towards the private sector. So that's one major reform that I want to, to do uh, that will allow government the space uh, to improve conditions of service. 
The other area that I want us to look at in Ghana, the new uh, policy framework I want us to implement, is to change the tax system. The tax system we have, we have lived with it since uh, independence and maybe before. That's what we've inherited. I've been looking at our tax system for a few years now, and you can see that the general consensus, whether you are looking at individuals, the businesses, is that it is a burdensome tax system. It is not a transparent tax system. A lot of businesses come in and they are given a tax bill and they are in perpetual argument with the tax authorities. How did you calculate this? They can't, they can't calculate it. They can't understand it. Same with individuals. And so there is not a lot of transparency. And so compliance within our framework, uh, within our system, compliance is very low. In fact, many people don't even want the tax authorities to know of their existence. So they don't even file tax returns. In fact, that is for most people in the country. Um, so, because the system can be complicated, and if you bring up your head and they see it, they may chop it off. So, there, there, there is a, a need to have a simple tax system, a transparent tax system, a tax system that is also easy to enforce by the tax authorities. I've looked at this matter uh, for the last couple of years, uh, looking at what type of tax system will serve Ghana best uh, and is very competitive globally. When I looked at the different countries and the tax systems in, in, in the different countries, I found out that the most competitive country in terms of tax competitiveness, the, the number one country in the world in terms of tax competitiveness, is Estonia. Estonia has been number one for the last 10 years in a row. So I, I found it very curious, read a bit about their system, and then took a team, including GRE and other, other people, and we went to Estonia to better understand the system and why it was so effective and people were so compliant. Their system is simple. It is a flat tax system. Flat tax is, if it's 10%, you know it's 10%. It's flat, right? This is 15 or 20%, that is it. So it's very easy to understand uh, for businesses and for individuals. And then you, you see that compliance is very, it's, it's very easy. It's like the tithe we pay in churches. If it's 10%, it's 10%. So that is very, very simple to do. So. That is what I believe Ghana should move to. We Ghana should move to a flat tax system, very understandable, and move away from this colonial system that we've inherited since independence that is not working. Many, many businesses come in, they receive tax bills, and they are shut down because they are not able to pay those tax bills. They are, they are locked up. When they are locked up, that means where people's jobs are, are taken away, and, and so on. And I believe that a flat tax system will really help us. And I think that um, next, I mean, by the grace of God, to, to when we get into office next year, what I want to do is to let us all start on a clean slate, a fresh slate for everybody. And that means for all of those who haven't filed taxes before and all of that, we are going to give a tax amnesty to everybody, businesses and individuals. So all our struggles with GRA and all of that, we are going to start afresh. A new tax system, a flat tax system, and therefore we are coming with a tax amnesty. A tax amnesty, everybody will start on a fresh, clean slate, and everybody will be um, 
filing their taxes going forward very simply because as for the tax filing it will take you two minutes or three minutes it's 10 percent or 15 percent just calculate it and you know what your your tax is due it's not complicated uh, but you see one of the things that you may ask okay how will this now ensure compliance when we came into office only four percent of adult Ghanaians had a tax identification number four percent that means 98, uh, 96% did not have a tax identification number. So if you are GRA, you only have data for 4% who have a tax identification number. The rest you don't know. You know so when, I, when we came in, I made the suggestion that when we do the Ghana card, let's make the Ghana card number the tax identification number. And so this is what has happened. Now, your tax identification number is your Ghana card number. So far, we've issued to adults in Ghana over 17.6 million Ghana cards. So now, you have the Ghana card number as your tax identification number. And immediately, immediately, we have gone up from the 4% of adults with tax identification number. Now, we have 85% of adults from 4% to 85%. And you know, you look at it from independence all the way to 2017, we had just 4%. Today we have increased from 4% to 85%, which means that GRA can tell now very clearly, because the Ghana card will tell you that these people should file, even if it's for zero taxes, they should still file. But now you know that these people have not filed. So you have the database to, to go after those who have not filed. And that is, that is important because most of the time, it is the formal sector, you and I, where the burden is on. It's not the informal sector. The formal sector is where the burden is on. And so whenever government feels tight or squeezed, they squeeze the formal sector to get more tax revenue. But if we can broaden the tax base and bring in more people, then the pressure on government to squeeze more from the formal sector reduces very, very significantly. So the flat tax system would allow, combined with you know the Ghana card and our tax identification numbers, would allow for more comp comp compliance in that sector. There's also a, a second leg of the tax reform that I want to, to look at, and that is to look at the import duty regime to match what we are doing for the income side. The import duty regime in, in Ghana is also one that traders and individuals who import have major problems with. Um, sometimes you import something and you think you are going to pay duty of say, 5,000 CDs, but when it arrives, they tell you it's 7,000 or 8,000 CDs. And you may not be able to pay, they will confiscate the good and maybe end up selling it for 2,000 CDs. Is it? Yes. Yeah, they will sell it for 2,000 CDs. Meanwhile, you were prepared to pay 5,000, but they would have confiscated the goods and all of that. And so I want us practically to take away, and a lot of these have to do with changes in exchange rate through the period and so on. But I believe that if we say we shouldn't price in dollars, then we should start it at the port. Because if you start pricing in dollars at the port, it then reflects in the rest of the country. So if we believe in our currency, then let us price in cities at a flat rate at the port. Let's price. So if a spare parts dealer is bringing in spare parts, I want flat rates so that the 40 footer container, you know that, okay, 40 footer is 20,000 CDs, and that is the flat rate. 20 footer is 10,000 CDs. So no matter when the, the container arrives, you know what the price is. It's very easy to comply with. It's rice, you know what it is. It's poultry, you know exactly what the the flat rate is in cities. And so 
Because if we keep pricing according to the dollar, there's an inflationary component of it because the trader, when he's going to the market, he will, or she will increase the price to make up for the duties they had to pay because there's no predictability. And not only are they increasing the price for today's duty, they will start thinking, oh, if I finish selling and I'm going back, maybe it will change again. And then they will increase some more. And so there's this inflationary bias that is introduced if we don't uh, bring predictability to the duty regime. And that's why I want us to do a flat rate in cities and bring predictability to the import duty regime. The next reform I want to bring about in the import duty regime is to look at our competitor neighboring country, which is Togo. Togo, I mean, the Lomi port and the Tema port are very close together. And so because our duties tend to be higher than their duties, a lot of containers are smuggled through Togo, through Lumi, and then through our porous borders into Ghana. That is what happens. And so we don't get the revenue of those goods coming into Ghana through the Togo border. I want us to stop that type of smuggling. And with what, how am I going to do that? I'm going to bring in a policy, a new policy, that says that Ghana's import duty for any good cannot be higher than Togo's import duty. You set a cap. Our duty cannot be higher than Togo. When that happens, nobody will have the incentive to smuggle again through Togo because you'll just be uh, wasting your time and money and effort and all of that. So we want to cap the import duty uh, so that you, you don't need, you, there's no, we can be lower, but we will not be higher. And that means that the goods will come through our ports and we will get the revenue from our ports. And that will change the whole mix. Uh, just simple policies like that uh, will, will help us uh, in, in, in so doing. I want to also bring in a new policy as far as the power sector is concerned. As you know, we've had challenges over the years in the area of power. And a lot of it has come, when I look at where, why we, where we are struggling, a lot of it has come through our dependence on fuel oils to generate power. Whenever we have challenges with fuel, we have challenges with power supply, by and large. But I want us as a country to move away from the fuel oils to solar power, to generate electricity in Ghana. I want solar to be really the heart of the generation mix. Right now, um, we are not, I mean, we are not really using a lot of solar. So my policy over the next four years, God willing, is that we should bring in 2,000 megawatts of solar power. That is doable. 2,000 megawatts. That's more than half our consumption of electricity. You add that to Akosobo, then you have really brought down the cost of power in this country. So that will bring down the cost of living, will help businesses to produce more because at ab initio, our businesses are very uncompetitive because you're paying 14 cents, 13 cents per kilowatt hour. Your competitors are paying 5 cents, 6 cents to produce the same good. You will have a problem. You can't compete. So I believe that if we can move towards solar power and bring in 2,000 megawatts to start with, um, it's, it will be very good. When I announced this policy on February 7th, uh, two major countries have come since that announcement to say each of them say they can do 2,000 megawatts in four years. And I said, oh, well, and maybe if you can do 2,000 each, then maybe we should do 4,000 <laughs> so that you can, each of you can do 2,000 rather than that if the price that you are talking about makes sense to us. But I think that if we, we do this, 
there will be huge potential. The first major potential, if we can move towards solar, is that it gives us an opportunity to set up solar panel manufacturing factories here in Ghana. We shouldn't just do solar by going to import solar panels. That would be a mistake. 2,000 megawatts of solar power means a lot of solar panels. It doesn't make sense for us to be importing all of those solar panels. We should produce them right here in Ghana. Establish that capacity and then be able to even export these panels to the sub-region. And I think that will create jobs uh, and create more opportunities for all of us. So I think that moving towards solar power becomes very, very important. I also believe that Ghana should refocus on large-scale commercial agriculture, mechanized agriculture, uh, irrigated agriculture, apply more technology, and all the, 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 the countries that have done so well, like Ukraine before the war that uh, they're going through right now, have really focused on large-scale commercial agriculture infusion of a lot of technology with irrigation to, to do that. And I believe that that would really help us bring down the cost of food. In the area of transportation, public transport, I am proposing that we move to electric vehicles. Electric buses uh, would really change the public transport cost significantly. Why do I say so? You don't have to be buying petrol or diesel every day to run them. They are running on, on, on power, on, on, on electric power, the batteries that are charged. The parts of the vehicle are very minimal. So the two elements in the cost of transport in our country is fuel and, and spare parts. We can really bring them down significantly. Anytime the fuel prices increase immediately, they increase the transport fares. But when they come down, they don't decrease them. So when I ask, why aren't you decreasing them? They tell me the spare parts prices have gone up. So I said, okay, very soon we'll have electric buses. And I'm hoping that we can have at least even 200 electric buses to have a proof of concept this year before we even enter next year so that people will see how the buses can bring down the cost of transportation in our country. And I believe that the, the estimates we, we have is that at least we will bring it down by at least 40%, which is very, very important for all workers in the public sector. And we are, we are, trying, we are talking to um, STC, uh, Nanakomia is here, Metro Mass, and they are all working, even VIP and all of that, towards Ghana moving electric uh, and, and, and all of that. That will bring down the cost of transport very significantly. Then one of the other areas I want us to, to do, which will really help all of us, is the digitalization of the land registration and transfer titling processes. The, the, the digitalization will really allow all of us. Right now, the dispute over land, uh, I'm sure we have all been victims uh, that you go and buy land and you think you, you bought it from the right owner, only to be in the middle of building and then you are told to stop work uh, because there's a case filed in court uh, that you, you are not the true owner of the land. The, the experiences of people is just so much in the area of land. And if you look at any country that has developed, look at all the advanced countries in the world, land has been one of the key factors because the wealth uh, in land is so huge. Because when you have land and you are developing land, it employs architects, it employs carpenters, Basins, you know, POP people, the, the employment that is generated in land is huge. Then you have mortgage markets developing. If you don't have a good sense of the title of land, you wouldn't have mortgage markets. Banks are afraid of even land as collateral because they could get themselves involved in litigation whenever it comes for enforcement. 
So they even discount, if you bring land, they, they discount your, 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 your land asset guardians. We should reserve them 100% for guardians. Because if we have the proving gold reserves, I believe we can get the capital to exploit those reserves. Once they are proven, and this is why I, I have a couple of ideas here. I believe that we should set up a minerals development bank that will be dedicated to the mining sector. And the second part is to formalize the small scale mining sector. Right now they are informal and they operate a lot of times under the radar and illegally in water bodies, in forest bodies, destroying the environment. But if we formalize them and license them and dedicate certain parts of the gold concessions to them, we will um, provide common user facilities to help them to extract the gold from what is mined. And then we have um, replanting and all of that as part of the framework. I believe that we can really um, make a lot of money out of it. And we will, under the policy I'm proposing, we will require a mandate that all the gold that is being mined under the small scale mining sector, which is around 50 tons every year, we should sell it to the Bank of Ghana and we will pay for it uh, at the market price to, to, the, to the small scale miners. And that will really be huge, to be huge, uh, adding 50 tons a year. 50 tons a year means about $3 billion a year. Think about it. Three billion, that's just from the small scale. I've not even come to the large scale. Three billion dollars a year to be added to our reserves. How much did we go to borrow from the IMF? Three billion, look at the hoops that they are taking us through. Three billion over how much? Over three years or more, isn't it? We can be getting three billion a year from gold. Right, every year. And that can change our whole framework in terms of, of that. So I believe that we should look at this. And the second part of, of this gold, this management of our natural resources, uh, the change that I'm proposing in the gold, in the gold sector in particular that we are, we are looking at. Because if we are accumulating gold reserves of the equivalent of about three billion dollars a year in gold reserves, then increasingly what is going to happen? We will be backing our city with gold. The whole world, there's a clamor among central banks to accumulate gold. You do the research and you see. Central banks are trying to accumulate gold. In Ghana, we are sitting on the gold, is it? And all we have to do is to dig it up and get it. Increasingly, we will end up, and I made this statement on February 7th, that I want Ghana to back our city with gold. If we have a gold-backed currency, the issue of persistent depreciation of the currency will go away, because that will be the issue. And then, even if you have to borrow internationally, I don't think we should borrow just like that we should borrow, we should issue a gold backed paper so that we can repay in gold. That will really bring down exchange, the interest rates on, on that type of borrowing. Uh, and so we should maximize the benefits and we are going to make sure that all gold that is mined is also refined here before we take it out. The beneficiation or in terms of the gold reserves that are mined, uh, we shouldn't just ship it out like that. And I believe that once we, we do this, we are going to empower our small-scale miners, we will help them grow to medium-scale and large-scale miners, and we will have major, major uh, impact uh, on our uh, finances as a country. I believe that we need, we have new growth poles that we should focus on, tourism, the creative arts, pharmaceuticals, and digitalization. I believe that 
the, the Ghana, frankly, right now in the in Africa, we are we are really at the forefront of digitalization. We have we have surpassed virtually most of the countries on the continent, and we are in fact competing with a lot of uh, developed and advanced countries. When I went to Estonia and we had a discussion on digitalization because they are the most digitalized country virtually in the world. And when we had that meeting with their team, they were shocked to see how far Ghana it had gone in the digital framework. There's just one thing that is uh, differentiating Ghana and Estonia, but I, in my view, just one thing. And that they have and that we don't have. Before the end of the year, we'll match them. We will, we will have exactly the system they have. Before the end of this year, we will match them. And, and, and so we are at the forefront of digitalization in Africa. And we need to leverage that. I believe that the, the skills of the young people, the digital skills, our young people are extremely conversant. And, and they have an affinity for digital uh, frame, the digital skills, and we should train them. I believe we can train a million youth in digital skills. It doesn't require a university degree. All you need is to be able to read and write. That's all. You can be trained in coding. In fact, there is going to be a model for the a module for the KIA. We are going to train some of them in coding. Yes, the KIA. Some of them are going to be trained in coding uh, to, in digital sales. Some of them have senior high school certificates. They will be trained. Uh, a few of them are going to be trained as bus drivers. These girls are going to be trained as bus drivers uh, and, and all of that. You know, so in terms of the IT sector, we believe we should really, because you can stay in Ghana and be working in Australia just on your computer. Be working in Germany. Once you have those skills, you you sell them across the world. And so we should we should really help our people. And miss uh, 30 years or so, um, it has served us very well, and it has it was built to provide us political stability after the turbulent years that we went through. The focus of the framers was if you see how it was put together, it's more to provide Ghana with political stability. But I think that we have attained political stability. We need a constitution that will provide us with economic development. And so I want to see a review of the constitution um, with that view, with a focus of the, on economic development. And also, we need to reduce the power of the presidency. If, even though I'm running to be a president, I don't think we need to have that as much power. We need to give some of that back to the people uh, in the context of this that we're doing. The other thing is that we should all, as political parties, try and buy into a national development plan. I think there are various broad contours of, you know, in areas such as education and health, industrialization, environment, and so on, that we can all agree to as political parties so that we can amend Article 87 of the Constitution, then, and also the NDPC Act uh, to mandate our manifestos to, to go by the agreed contours the broad contours that we will have agreed and have consensus so that it doesn't matter which government comes in, there will be consistency in the implementation you know, of education policy, of health policy, and so on. So you don't have to go back, come again, go back and come again. One government will come and it is three years senior high school, another will say four years senior high school, and all of that. We, we, the inconsistency doesn't help our country. And so I would like to see us move in that direction. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said right at the beginning, um, you know, if we can expand the economy, expand incomes, uh, you'll have better pension benefits. 
Because if you are not earning a lot, how do you get better pension benefits? You should earn a lot and, and, and all of that. And if we implement some of these policies that I'm talking about, you increase the, the, the incomes, you increase, you eat better the conditions of service, you have better pensions. I, um, as I said, that my whole philosophy uh, is that it is possible. Why do I say so? In fact, when the Closet Band was playing the Bob Marley song, uh, Emancipate Your Mind from Mental Slavery. That is exactly what I'm talking about. I believe that our minds sometimes are not emancipated. We don't feel we are good enough. We don't think we can do better than the white man. We always think that it's they who have to teach us and we have to learn from them. Not that we can take the lead and they will learn from us. I believe we can do better than them if we put our minds to it. You know, and so I am saying that, you know, Ghana, even if you look at what we have done, you know, today, Ghana is the number one country in the world, the whole world, in terms of delivery of medicines by drones. Number one country. Number one. And all the people manning our drone centers, the six drone centers, all are 100% Ghanaians. Young men and women. Two months ago, the mother company in San Francisco came to recruit a Ghanaian to go and lead a team in San Francisco on drone flight operations. Because the experience is here. They are, do, they are the best in the world. We are the best in the world in these, in these things. You, you have digital address system that we implemented. We are only the second country in the world to do so. Today, we have the Ghana card, a digital ID card. The EU has asked all its countries to issue the Ghana card equivalent by 2030. 2030, they don't have it. Today, the US is discussing it in the Senate and the Congress that they should also issue a digital ID card. In the United States, they don't have it. Mobile money interoperability, they don't have it in the United States. We are the first country in Africa to do so. E-pharmacy, they don't have it. We are the first country in Africa to do so. So we have to understand that we can be the best. We can really be the best if we put our minds to it. And I want us to, to come together. And, and, and I want Ghana to give me a chance to take this leadership and to take the steer and drive this vehicle. I, I have a lot of clarity in terms of where I want to go. I've, I want to fight corruption. And corruption really requires a lot of political will to fight it, isn't it? I've been fighting corruption with a lot of systems, digital systems, that we have been using. When we face the issue of ghost workers, I said, let every worker be identified with their Ghana card. Isn't it? So every worker has fingerprints, but the ghosts don't have fingerprints. Immediately we said that the ghost disappeared. In the National Service Scheme alone, 44,000 workers disappeared. In SNIT pension, SNIT pensioners, 19,000 people disappeared. The two alone saved over 700 million Ghana cities a year. So systems can help us deal with corruption. That's what we have done in the ports, with paperless, DVLA, and so on. But you also need the political will to enforce corruption, but the, the fight against corruption. I'm prepared for it. 
uh, and I want you to give me the opportunity and the, the chance to take Ghana to a different level. I, I believe that, and this is why we are consulting very broadly, I believe that we can do something new for our country, something much better. And I want to work very closely with you, to consult with you every day. I want to help. I want to help the vulnerable. I want to help the poor. I want to help the disadvantaged. I want to use this opportunity to change Ghana. Thank you very much for your attention. A round of applause for His Excellency. And before we move ahead, a short of was we stretch our hands. system 
of salary participation in the public services. And this is what the single spine sought to kill. It has widened, the deficiencies have widened. I just had one of my secretaries go to parliamentary service. And when I saw the figures, I think one of them I said, wow. He's even working less. Now he, he, he closes at uh, uh, 40. When he was here, he was looking at seven. And he's anymore. Why? Is this fair? No. no. So we have to look at differentials in the public service. So we are not even looking at the uh, uh, private sector. In the services. You go to other services, the gaps are too big. Let's narrow them. That is what we sought to do with single spine. And I beg to differ. We shouldn't even call it single spine because we don't have a single spine. <laughs> do you have a single spine? No! We don't have a single spine. We have multiple spines in the public service. Multiple spines. Even the one that is supposed to do the what you want for a single spine is not on the single spine. It's not a single spine. <laughs> so, I'll pause, I'll pause, I'll pause because we've had a, such a wonderful presentation from our, His Excellency. In fact, he is full of energy. Don't try to meet his energy. When he was coming in and I was going around, I said, my, back, ah, my friend, I follow the His Excellency. I said, sure, we did not go on. And it's... Um Restructuring the white paper on SNIT saying that we have to restructure SNIT and then the governance structure. Uh, I think I could not disagree with you uh, in this particular on this particular issue uh, because the workers are the owners of the funds and therefore it's very clear that they must have a say uh, or even the decisive say on where the, the funds are put. Right on, right on. Right on funds in a bad place is the workers who are going yeah. to suffer, isn't it? So I, I don't I think we can definitely look at the, the governance structure. Uh, again, I think that there's no issue. The other major issue that you have raised is essentially the, the single spine which is non existent. Uh, uh, or you talk about this apartheid system and the multiple spines. Uh, I think that really all, and this is not the first time I've heard about uh, this issue uh, recently. Um, even today, this morning, I heard about it. Uh, so it calls for a serious review of what we have right now. Uh, it's clear that what was supposed to be the solution to a problem has not worked out. You know, so I think we all need to sit around the table again and see how best forward to look at these multiple spines uh, and, 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 and have a system that everybody will see that the differential, differentials are not that big in the system. So I'm open for that discussion for us to take place and re-examine the whole single spine policy. In this area is the Ghana card, so that everybody is identified individually and in fact, I've been talking with the IGP, the fact that we need to link, and this is what we are going to do, the Ghana card database with the criminal database. Sometimes today, we re recruit people, we hire people to work in our homes, and we have no idea who they are. That some of them have been in prison, some of them have stolen, and you don't have any idea. They bring them into your house and they could end up killing you. And so you should be able to do background checks. This is what I, I was telling the IGP and this is what we're going to do. You should be able to do background checks on individuals before you recruit them. So that you get, with their permission, their Ghana card ID and put it in the police database on your mobile phone and the information should come up whether this person has been convicted or, or whatever, has been fined or whatever. That background check, we should be able to. So I think that the character reference, for example, if you do a credit reference check on somebody, 
if they have failed to repay a loan, it will appear. Even fail to repay electricity bill, it will appear <laughs> in the in the character in the in the you know reference thing because your payment, you know your car repayments and so on will all be part of the system. So I think the heart is to individually identify anybody and be able to report things that have been done. If someone has stolen uh, from workplace, that report is an adverse report. It should be going there so that we can find out about people. So that Ghana card is a very good instrument for the character reference. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. It's an independent arm of government, just as parliament and the executive. The judicial service is not too different from the parliamentary service because we both provide support service to the arms of government. For the past 10 years, we have had to either threaten or declare strike every two years when our salaries are about to be reviewed. And for the past 32 years, after the coming into being of the 1992 constitution, a very serious provision Article 158.2, h 2 which is supposed to address our condition of service, has not been implemented for 32 years. And it says that the Judicial Council, in consultation with the Public Service Commission, should come up with a constitutional instrument that will define our condition of service. And they must do so with the prior approval of the President. And that is where our heartbeat comes. Because once we have approval of the president, we all know where the challenges usually comes. Honorable Osei Chiemen was aware in 1995 they had CI 11 for the parliamentary service. In 2019 they had CI 118 for them to enhance their condition of service. And for 32 years we haven't had this. I'm glad the judicial council has made significant progress, but we are afraid that the process may be challenging. Uh, also comforted that we have a vice president who is very instrumental in the affairs of this government. So we want to make a passionate appeal to you, Your Excellency. You will gladly intervene so that we don't have difficulty. We want to see the judicial service regulation being passed into law even before the election period uh, commences and not when you have become president, inshallah. That is one key issue we have. Hey. Last one, please. <laughs> For the sake of time, we've mentioned about the constitutional reforms. And it's very obvious that when the judiciary is mentioned, people try to read certain meanings and question the independence of the judiciary which has been granted both judicial... You have 30 seconds. <laughs> when there is a chance for us to review our constitution, we will pray that you look at clauses in the constitution... That Thank you very much, Your Excellency. The judiciary. Thank you. Before, to add to what he has said. To the point! To the constitution says that equal pay for equal work. That's what the Constitution says. It includes pensions. What? We don't understand why in the same public service, some people are being paid pension that they are not contributing. For. And in 1972, all the research was done, and it was realized that this captain pay we cannot pay since 1972. Now we see a situation where captain has come back better enhance allowances. Allowances have now been consolidated into pensions. And these are going to be paid from the consolidated fund that they have not even contributed to. And we have contributed and then our pensions are not being even paid. Snit, we have so much pension arrears. We are paying you. We are contributing to our pension. And it's not being paid. Some people are not contributing to their pension. And immediately it is paid. This is the pattern system of salary admission in yeah, the public services. It's it must stop. Oh no, it's just killing. <laughs> it must stop. And talk about past credit. We are so much past credit. The law said 
transfer past credits to the uh, public sector schemes or the schemes. We have not seen the day of that. State is still holding it. It's also giving us ridiculous rates for our money that we are holding. Still, the AM show Last question. Then we'll take everything. I'm Kiali Aoudou, President, Coalition for Saint Teachers Ghana. Uh, we are African Education Service. We are great teacher unions. The NAT president is here. Nagrat will really make you do, but they are aware of everything that is going on. Mr. President, your Excellency. the heartbeat of every economy and the only way a nation can prosper in the future and rub shoulders with those in the West that your excellency really wanted to become better than is to look at our education and look at it critically. One of the greatest challenge in Ghana's education has to do with the lower level education. Currently, there is a lot of intervention going on in lower level education, but it's sparingly, sparingly. The new JHS block that are building, country wise, if you are counting, is not even up to 10. What is happening is that there is a gradual collapse of basic education in this country. Basic education in this country currently is only effective in the rural communities. Highly effective in rural communities where many parents do not have the option of a private basic school. But when you come to the public basic school in the urban areas, sometimes you don't even find the schools. And when you find them, there are no students or there are no pupils. The middle income worker, including even the teachers themselves that teach, will take their children to the nearby private school. Not because the teachers there are better, but because infrastructure there is better. Children basically learn by playing. The state of a lot of our busy schools are no good. We should look at it critically. Two, government, this, uh, the MPP government led by His Excellency Nenado Banko Abufuado, is very keen on senior high school. And the kind of investment that has been made in senior high school for the past seven years leave a lot to be desired. I teach in the senior high school. And I know the state of the school before 2017 and the state of the school today. Development that has been done in the school. Your Excellency, we want that political will that your boss used in the senior high school to be used at the basic school. That political will to transform senior high education. Next year, God willing, if you become president, let's see a policy towards transforming basic education in this country. Thank you very much. So, last question for this year, my friend here. Then, Your Excellency, wrap it up for us. My name is um, Professor Yo from the Ghana Medical Association. What I'm raising is at the core of healthcare delivery in this country, and I'm sure I speak the minds of many unions and even the ministry. I'm talking about rural, urban dichotomy in terms of distribution of health workers, critical health workers, and also the brain drain. You know, um, some policies in the past attempted to stem the outward migration of health professionals, but no more. I am a, a trainer of doctors as well, and almost on a weekly basis, I'm seeing people asking for attestation to be able to move outside. Some of the reasons are because 
you want to advance knowledge. But primarily, you and I and everybody here knows that it's driven by the economics. I don't have to talk about the plummeted real incomes because of what is going on. But as a union and as stakeholders in the space, we have partnered the Ministry of Health to put together what we call the Deprived Area Incentive Allowance or Incentives. Now this paper or document is done. It is gathering dust. Now if I live in Accra and I'm paid X amount, I live in a typical village and I also paid X, what would I say in the village? That's no incentive. Now when I live in Accra, I have the option of doing extra work to get more money. And then once I live in Accra, it's also easier for us or for you to migrate because that, that push factor is also there very strongly. So what we have fought for over the decades is this document, it's gathering us. So please, if it hasn't captured your attention, I want you to bring it to your reader. I raise it or we raise it with your people when they first met us. Earlier. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much for those uh, set of questions. I think that um, the Jusag, I think my brother Abdullah raised the issue uh, of the lack of comparative treatment between the judicial service and the parliamentary service. And, 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 and this is what the chairman was talking about, the apartheid uh, systems in, 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 in this. Um, I think that what I can assure you, I was just asking when I looked at 158.2 in the Constitution, I was just asking Chairman, so what, is, what stops, when you say, what stops the President from approving? Because I'm not, it's not quite clear to me why there isn't, why there is sort of a stumbling block at that level. So uh, once uh, all things being equal, you can, assure, you can be assured that you will have my support in that matter. Then you have, um, you talked about, you know, when we review the constitution, we should reinforce the independence of the judiciary. I don't have uh, any problem with that. And, and then the whole issue about equal pay for equal work and, 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 and the fact that some people are, are being paid um, allowances or pensions which they haven't been contributing to. And, and I think that's a serious matter. It's a very serious matter. And I think when we are reviewing this whole uh, salary, single spine and all of that, these issues should all be part of, of, the, of the comprehensive review because it's a, it's, a, 